Hello and welcome to an entirely handmade arcade. This two-thirds size arcade cabinet was custom designed and built to fit an era traditional analog CRT television. This TV, though nothing special other than being old, is also custom too. The tube TV was modified to accept RGB inputs to give a stock Model 2 Sega Genesis or Mega Drive the best image possible. This arcade's control panel has a reverse engineered controller along with special user controls to turn the machine on and off as well as enable a coin operated credit mode to make it a true arcade. After all, Sega's ad campaign for the Genesis and Mega Drive was a true at home arcade experience. So let's give this console the platform it deserves to deliver on those promises. Please sit back, relax, and I will explain all the features that give this arcade the retro razzle dazzle. This is no doubt a pretty involved build, so I've split the construction into five main topics. The cabinet, the control panel, the internal wiring, audio and the lighted marquee, and a special section for the television. Some of the more interesting topics I've already made a dedicated video on. If you need more details on say how to RGB mod an analog TV or reverse engineer a, a Genesis controller, check the playlist and the links in the description. So let's begin with the cabinet construction first. Hello, I wanna talk about the design of this cabinet and the previous version that I built uh, before we get to the like final design. So the current design, the new design, involves all this blocking that is basically custom drawn to fit all the exterior contours of the cabinet. Uh, before I got to this point, the old design, which is what I'm building in this video, the blocking is very simple. Uh, and it takes a little bit of, you have to build the thing before you can validate your design, because otherwise you're drawing with CAD with really no experience of what the build process is like, and some things you just don't find out until later until you build it. So let's continue on. You can definitely build this cabinet with some standard tools like a jigsaw, a circular saw, and a hand drill, but I don't recommend it because it's going to be tough. The whole point is I want this cabinet to go together quickly because of the blocking, and the blocking is custom aligned to go exactly where it needs to go with no guesswork or measurement, and we do that with a CNC. So fortunately, I know somebody who has access to a big CNC, and that's what we're gonna use here. So setting up the job profile, the cam, Looks like this and the total runtime for this job on a four foot by eight foot sheet of three quarter inch plywood is about 43 minutes. Uh, the new design takes about an hour. We save that with a little bit of guesswork for putting the body panels on later. So anyway, the majority of the blocking was just cut into straight sections and the CNC also helped me cut out this little port view window which kind of shows off the interior or the main console running this arcade. So the blocking cut into strips has to be cut down to length. And this is the first thing that I noticed that I didn't like about this design, which is why it got revised later. But the blocking goes in with these dowel pins and they're glued and that helps align the side panels. So throughout this building process, I'm just putting side panels on and keeping things clamped as I glue them. Once all the glue dries for the blocking, we just use a flush cut saw to trim off the excess and we'll take care of any scuff marks in the paint section later. The angles of a lot of this blocking uh, in these corners was where a lot of the guesswork involves and it's kind of a slow process to get the length of the panels correct as well as the angles right. Uh, and also building this in the dead of winter where it's like 20% humidity here in the mid-Atlantic, this plywood was drying out very quickly and starting to warp. So just clamps had to be on it at all times to keep this from going out of square. This little angle gauge did help me with some of the angles of the body panels where you just lay it on it, assuming you have a level surface that it's sitting on. And then you just take this magnetic angle guide, put it on your table saw, and then you can match that angle of what you're trying to cut. Still, some of my interior blocking was a bit too long, so some cuts and fixes had to be made later. But at this point, the entire cabinet is built for the most part, and we can test fit to make sure our monitor, the tube TV fits, and our backup monitor in case I drop this, which is possible during this test fitting process. And this is a pretty common LCD, so most arcade cabinets of modern times would work for this, but... Anyway, the one panel that I couldn't CAD because of the curvature of the monitor was the front bezel for 
the CRT tube. And this just involves some penciling around of where I think the cutout was. And I did this by hand a couple times just to make sure the final dimensions and measurements were accurate. And in the end, this panel was laser cut since I'm doing a couple layers for it. It did take a few iterations of testing this with cardboard just to make sure the fit was correct. But in the end, I cut some acrylic plastic and some matte black poster board just to keep a uniform color around the bezel. One thing that did help me a lot was this design, which is just a nut and bolt underneath the panel that supports the monitor. And this lets me adjust up and down the vertical position of the monitor, which can be like a lot of guesswork when you're trying to fit a couple things that depend on each other at once. The bezel covering the monitor or TV is just held in place with this angled 3D printed bracket. So to remove the TV, you have to take it out from the front and just removing this bracket lets you slide out that bezel. The other panel that had to be done was the marquee cutout and at this point the arcade cabinet wasn't square up here so I had to cut an out of square thing to do it and a couple test fit versions of cardboard and this panel is glued on and done. The porthole is laser cut too out of acrylic. Its main feature is it also supports the coin slot. And I also cut a black matte poster board border to go around, which kind of helps accentuate and clean up that edge. I did cut a couple different variations of this porthole. Uh, the main one is there's a full blocked version of it or two halves of it if you don't want like open access to the console. So if this machine was out in public, you could block this off. It's only accessible by the back, but, but I didn't want that if I'm gonna change games with this arcade like at my home. So I just cut a trim piece and I can stick my hand through. Next thing is the speaker panel, which I wasn't sure, but I just ended up going with three inch speakers and we'll talk about that main construction later. But I just cut a panel to the right size and length and used a hole saw to cut two holes. The rear panel that covers like the access port to the monitor, this had to be custom. And I also need a big cutout because unfortunately this tube TV is a bit long with its body and I don't want to take the chassis out of the body just cause it kind of holds it's all structure together. But this panel also has two hole cutouts for fans because if this TV chassis that's inside a case that's inside an enclosure, uh, it might not be able to breathe, so I wanted to use some active cooling with fans on the bottom. Next, we move on to just some filling the wood with some Bondo and making sure the uniform surface is all sanded for this thing. And I roll on two coats of really thick paint primer, brand name stuff, to cover up this really ugly wood. And you need to put as many coats on until you hide the, essentially the grain of the wood. You can see one coat right here, and the presence of the grain is still visible, so keep going if, if this is your case. Next, I just chose some paint that was lying around. It is brand name paint and it's the color is nebulous white, which is like one shade into gray away from like the extra white base color. And I put three coats of this and it still basically looks the same based on this video. Team molding is relatively simple unless you screw it up like I did. Normally, all you have to do is get a slot cutting bit and put it in something like a trim or palm router and run it through the side profile of your cabinet. Then you can just bang in the T-molding. However, if you're like me and you're so excited to use a brand new out of the box palm router and you forget to fully tighten the set screw that keeps the sleeve from sliding up and down, you might actually cut this thing off center. And if it's off center, you can just recut it again to center it. And now the T molding gap is too wide for the barb to fit in there snugly. A trick you can do to fix this, but it's a shortcut, is put some layers of duct tape over the barb to make it a little bit thicker, but this fit is still pretty sloppy. You could try and fill in the gaps with some sawdust and wood glue, but I have to do the entire right side of the cabinet like this. And this method is so sloppy, it's just, it's awful. So after a day of frustration, I took a break and really the way you should do this is cut some strips of wood that are just snug enough to fit in the gap, fill all the gaps with glue, let it set and dry, then use a flush cut bit on your router, trim all the excess that's protruding, recut the slot, sand it, repaint it, and then you have a nice T molding slot. So yeah, just check yourself before you wreck your cabinet on like what I did. 
If your slot is cut correctly, everything should hammer in snugly and smoothly the first try. So this was one and a half times doing the T-molding, but I'm satisfied with it. So just, yeah. The last thing for this cabinet is the outlet, and this just comes from like a dead 3D printer that I salvaged some parts. This is just an IEC receptacle with a built-in filter and on-off switch, which is all we need for this cabinet. So to cut out this hole, I'm gonna drill four holes in each corner and then use an oscillating tool to cut out the remainder of the slot. Unfortunately, the oscillating cutter is a little bit too wide for the top and bottom, so I'll just switch to a coping saw to do the rest of the sides. The main rear access panel on the arcade is held in place by this small latching clasp that you can reach in from the front or right below the rear underneath the TV. And that's the entire cabinet. Here's the bare inside of the cabinet, and at this point I think most people would stop because we have a master on-off switch on the outside, and if you just add a power strip on the inside, you can power all the interior devices and control it on and off from the exterior. But I'm not the only one building arcade cabinets on YouTube, so we need to up the ante and add some special features. And I'll talk about those specifics in the next couple of segments. The control panel is the heart of this arcade and gives it its most unique characteristic of, wow, that's complicated, why would you do that? And for this arcade, I just had to. First, the basics. The start and ABC buttons are just regular Suzohap concave push buttons, which are pretty standard for any American arcade machine. The joystick is a Sanwa JFL TP, and I've chosen these because these are what I like. Underneath this control panel is the first PCB I designed for this project, which is just a reproduction or reverse engineered Sega Genesis controller. So instead of taking apart a Sega Genesis controller and basically sacrificing it to be the control panel to interface with the Sega, I just made my own. And well, there's not much to that circuit, so that's what the core of this control panel is, and they're just connected with a Sega Genesis aftermarket controller extension cable. Right above the arcade buttons is likely the most, oh, that's interesting feature for this arcade. And that's the second PCB I designed for projects like this, which is just a breakout board for Cherry MX switches, which breaks out every switch and every LED underneath that switch. These keys turn on and off the main components of the arcade, and they're all switched off and on by a relay down below. And we'll get to the main electronics wiring later. When there's power to the cabinet, and this little animation will play once you first power it on, these keys are the idle keys that will let you turn on and off the main components of each section of the arcade. So the first two, S and E, turn on the marquee and the body LEDs, if that's your thing. The reason to turn them on and off independently is sometimes if you're playing games, they can be a little bit distracting or annoying, and if this arcade is meant for someone's living room, Sometimes these additional lights just don't set the mood, so you can turn them off. The next two keys turn on the Sega Genesis, that's the G for game, and the A turns on audio. You can toggle between the amplifier turning on and off, just in case you need to quickly mute something or turn sound off and let the game play in a quiet demo state. Originally, I wanted one of these buttons to also turn the TV on and off through a relay in the bottom. But as I found out, this TV, as long as it has residual power, if it's on and you pull the plug, it will remember its power state as soon as the plug is re-energized. But if that power dissipates, then the TV doesn't remember that it was on. So if I was gonna use this button, it basically means it might not work 100% of the time, which is not a good feature to implement in your arcade. So instead, I just made a large cutout in the bezel and you just turn the TV on by its front panel button and I have to live with that. So that's what these four keys do. They just toggle on and off and also illuminate turning various subsystems on the cabinet. It's totally optional, totally unnecessary, but totally cool. And that's kind of the whole thing for Sega arcades. 
something that I had to do because not just because I had an extra coin slot acceptor, but in order to take a console and put it in an arcade machine, it's not really an arcade machine unless there's some kind of credit system that limits your play. And that's something I wanted to implement as well. So in the square in the center of this control panel is a 4x20 LCD that you normally use for like Arduino microcontrollers. And right above the joystick are some mode options that basically toggles the controls on and off and the credit system on and off. If we press the button all the way on the right and this will latch and stay in place, this bypasses the credit system and allows the controller to be in free play mode. I'm using a relay and an Arduino to either to detach the ground that closes the loop on all the buttons, disabling the button inputs on the controls. If this upper right user button is pressed, the LCD backlight turns off, so it kind of hides itself in the control panel and free play mode is enabled and you wouldn't know any difference that this arcade is just a standard Sega Genesis arcade. But if you release that button and then toggle the button on the left, press it and it will latch, that is the coin operating mode. Attached underneath this control panel is a lot of wires, but also a basic Arduino and a breakout board that I made. And this is driving that screen and also counting time since a credit was input. You can set how long the credit gives you playtime based on this potentiometer, and that can be anywhere from 30 seconds to five minutes. Every time you insert a coin while the demo time is still valid or hasn't expired, that set amount of time gets added to your current playtime. As long as you keep pumping quarters, your playtime will keep compounding, but if it expires, then you have to scramble to put a quarter in and make sure you don't like lose a life or you get a game over. If your demo time has expired, the controls on the right hand side are disabled until you put in a quarter or a credit. So if the demo time is set to one minute and you're basically 10 seconds away from timing out, if you insert another quarter, you get another minute added onto that and the controls are not interrupted. If the timer times out, the start and ABC buttons get interrupted or disconnected and they no longer function. And this is done just by breaking this connection through a relay, which is also connected underneath this control panel. You can do this for the directional inputs as well, but I just decided the main action buttons and the start button was good enough. So yeah, that's the control panel. It turns the machine on and off. It also lets you control some of the additional features and core features and it's also, if you want it to be, a credit or timer system if you want to play Sega Genesis games with quarters. Far down inside the cabinet is a little bucket where the quarters are collected, which is a old container for feta cheese, if you wanted to know. And that's the extent of how I wanted to take the coin slot. The middle button right here doesn't do anything yet. I just kind of got tired of writing code and wiring features that are just for the razzle dazzle. The wood part of this control panel was cut out of quarter inch wood on a laser cutter and I drew this up in Inkscape because anything with a lot of specific holes, I typically just use a laser cutter and draw those vector graphics by hand. The artwork of the control panel was also drawn by me. I just recreated it by looking at reference photos online. And again, I use Inkscape for all my 2D and vector graphics drawing. And lastly, the control panel is just the wood, the graphics printed on glossy photo paper with a clear acrylic laser cut top. And all these layers are sandwiched together through the arcade buttons and binding posts are in the corners that keeps the acrylic from lifting up in the corners. Oh, and one more thing before I forget, you can implement this kind of control panel disable enable with basically any console that uses a multiplexer to encode the signals to the console, but you can't just pick and choose which leg of the button that you're gonna disconnect. So in this case, this is the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive controller schematic. The reason why I'm disconnecting the ground line is because these controls by default are pulled up with pull-up resistors to five volts. So if you were to choose choose to disconnect the five volt line, you would disrupt the multiplexer talking to the Sega Genesis 
and that would make your controls behave erratically. So disconnecting the ground is okay because we do not leave these input buttons floating as far as the multiplexer or console is concerned. The internal wiring of this cabinet is a complete custom job and it was probably the most difficult part to do because I was just working from a bunch of general ideas I didn't know how to combine until I actually just kind of brute forced my way through and wired everything up. So we're going to look at the overall diagram to understand how everything's connected. And just a disclaimer, this is only one way to do things. I did it this way because the fastest way to get something built is to just make a decision and go with it, whether it makes the most sense or not. And I didn't want to wait on a lot of custom parts and custom supplies since I was trying to build from what I had. So we already talked about the IEC switched outlet and filter combination. And that's what brings AC power into the arcade cabinet. And that's just wired to a single gang AC outlet. From that outlet, I've got the TV plugged in directly and turning the TV on and on is just done by the front panel power button, the details of which I'll talk about a little bit later. From that AC outlet, I have a large five volt DC power supply. This doesn't have to be a big five volt supply. It can be 12, but again, parts that I had on hand, this large five volt supply powers both the marquee backlight and the interior lights. Those are the, which is a combined strand of about 112 addressable LEDs, which run on five volts, so this makes good sense. So the LEDs are connected with a custom board that I made only to drive the LEDs and to have nothing else fancy other than I want to individually control sections of the cabinet's color if I wanted to set some kind of theme or mood. So the marquee and the interior lights based on this little custom board, I can control the sections of LEDs by segments. And I just have potentiometers that let you set whatever the RGB mix is for both these sections. And you can also cycle to a mode that just does rainbow colors, but that's the extent of what I wanted this controller to do. Don't want any Wi-Fi connectivity. I just want a dumb board that will drive the LEDs and do nothing else. And this is all from five volt. The data line is always active for this controller that's running these LEDs. However, the Arduino at the core of this wiring setup is actually what's looking at the buttons on the control panel and telling which relays to turn on and off based on those buttons. From there, I added a nine volt step up or boost converter. This little breakout board powers this boost module that I made and it just makes wiring a little bit easier and cleaner. And this nine volt power line powers the Sega Genesis and the forced air fans that turn on with the Sega and hopefully this cools the TV since the TV's in a case which is inside another box so active cooling is probably a good idea. There's another DC boost breakout board that boosts things to 12 volts and this is needed for the audio amp that requires 12 volt input which then goes to the speakers. And the last thing that needs power which is also 5 volts is yet another Arduino which is controlling a relay that either makes or breaks the ground connection to the Sega Genesis controller buttons. So your first question might be why all the Arduinos? Well, they're really inexpensive at one or two dollars. It's much easier to have dedicated microcontrollers with very simple programs than one master microcontroller with a very complex program that's trying to juggle and handle all these inputs. I think the worst thing about anything with lots of buttons is if the buttons don't respond quickly enough or miss your inputs, especially if you were to insert a coin when some other subroutine is running and it doesn't catch that input. And I think the other most common question that I'll get is what are all these other PCBs that I'm using? And again, these are things that I've made over the years to help assist with a lot of the wiring that I do for tiny arcades like this. And medium arcades like this. So these are just small creations that I've done that help kind of break out common buck or boost modules as well as just make things a little bit easier to wire direct on off switches and control main power distributed through a tiny arcade. 
Other things like this parallel screw terminal board just breaks out all the Arduino pins on one of these Arduino Nanos to screw terminals, and this is something that's very convenient. For applications like this, where there's a couple feet of wiring that you might have to change as the design of the arcade adapts through different ideas. There's a link in the description where you can buy all these PCBs if that's something you're interested in. Moving to the top of the arcade, you can see the marquee artwork is just sandwiched between two layers of clear acrylic plastic and the artwork is printed on glossy photo paper. Behind the marquee, what illuminates it is just 54 addressable LEDs, all driven as the second portion of the set of LEDs from the body. These LEDs can be white light or any color that you want them to be. This is an example of just some colors mixing in idle. And also a feature of this arcade cabinet, you can turn the marquee on and off if the light is too distracting because this is a living room arcade. So you have that option. Speaker assembly uses as little hardware as possible because it's all assembled in a sandwich and the nuts and bolts kind of share by holding the backlights and the speakers together. Uh, so the speakers in the front, it's just some PC grade fan covers or grills uh, that just keeps fingers out of the speaker cones. And then the speakers go on top and then this big cover plate, which kind of sandwiches the speaker and the bolts go through, holds everything in place. What's driving the speakers is this modestly priced amplifier, 20 watts that you can find on Amazon. And it just gives you left and right channels with analog inputs. And that's giving the Sega Genesis its full sound. So the speakers I started with are full range, three inch diameter. And unfortunately the first ones I had intended for this project are not recommended for using with CRT because they were unshielded speakers. And you can see some of the nuts and bolts still stuck to the exposed magnets. This is a problem because CRT displays use magnetic fields to direct the electron gun on where to draw on the screen. And if you have any stray magnetic fields, that's going to disrupt the picture. And you can see that this little pink area is directly influenced from these unshielded speakers. So I had to go searching online and found some good replacement mid-range general use speakers and make sure you use shielded speakers if you're using uh, tube TVs for this. The amplifier is stored near the bottom of the cabinet and I might move this just to have access to the volume control. The other main point is with all the electronics wired I did add a ground loop isolator connected to the audio just so there's no feedback coming through the power supplies because uh, there's a few different power supplies because we have a couple different voltages running through this arcade cabinet. Next, I wanna talk about my favorite feature about this arcade, and it's this TV. But it's not just any TV, it's an RGB modded television. I already did a pretty extensive video on, which I'll leave a description below, but the core of it is, if you have a console that can output RGB, which the Sega Genesis can, it's just a vanilla Sega Genesis. The only difference here is SCART cable, which carries the RGB signals, and then a SCART to RGB BNC connector cable, which was 50% of all my costs here. If you have that signal, you can basically find a television that if this old tube TV supports on-screen display, or just basically has a overlay of the channel number or some on-screen menu, you can find this chip on the motherboard, which is typically a jungle chip, find the traces, reverse engineer it, and basically inject your own RGB signal, override the on-screen display toggle, and display whatever RGB signal you want. So this Sega Genesis and this TV are displaying crisp RGB signals on what's basically a $5 garage sale TV circa 2002. So this was a little bit of a complicated mod because this television and the chassis is somewhat modern. It's like the most modern of its era before they were discontinued forever. So the circuit board was pretty dense and complex and it took a little bit to reverse engineer and find those traces of where to inject the RGB. But if you can identify the chips, you can find the three or four signals that you can do this. So it is a poor man's version of a basically RGB arcade quality monitor, all done with you know things that people are still throwing out to this day. So this television was basically the foundation and idea for building this entire arcade. 
this is a 13 inch TV, which is the biggest, smallest TV that makes this arcade and scale manageable. Any bigger in the arcade gets a little bit too big. So a 13 inch TV makes for this scale and cabinet something I can lift, transport, and eventually carry up a flight of stairs if I want to move this arcade. So if you do find a discarded tube TV that is still in working order, and from a glance you can see that it is somewhat new, and if it doesn't even have to have component video, if it has S-video or just even composite, if it supports an on-screen display or menu, basically when you're scrolling through the channels and it overlays the number or the input, it is a good candidate for RGB modding. This is not a beginner type of mod, but there's lots of information on the internet that this is something you can do to rejuvenate and even give new life and a new experience to some discarded and old technology. Okay, there's also some miscellaneous things that didn't really fit in these categories, but this stool is a custom job, so that was CNC'd painted and I even team molded this stool to match the aesthetic of this arcade. You don't need a custom stool for this and any folding chair will kind of work for this like sit down candy cabinet sized arcade. Also since I've gone through the trouble of making my own Sega Genesis reproduction controller I've also done all the legwork of how to burn your own EEPROM reproduction Sega Genesis or Mega Drive games. There's a link in the description down below for that really long video that walks you through the entire process. So if I'm going to have a dedicated Sega arcade, I might as well be able to have whatever game I want. And I'm sure you're saying, well, why not use a flash cart? And that's a great idea. You could, but I like retro gaming for the expense and inconvenience. And that's what this entire arcade cabinet project is all about. Well, if you made it this far, thank you for watching. I'm going to take some frequently asked questions now, which I'm anticipating I'll see in the comments. So what is the overall size of this arcade and how heavy is it? These are the cabinet dimensions based on the CAD model. Uh, so again, it's like two thirds scale and I think it's about 80 pounds. I don't have a scale to put it on, but when I lift it, it's heavy, but it's not impossible for one person to pick up and put on a dolly but it is a two person job to get up the stairs. However, it's still small enough to feel like a full size cabinet and be transported with an SUV. How much would this cost to build? This is my estimated cost if you were gonna build this and that's kind of like starting from the ground up. Uh, it's going to be around $500 just because if you, assuming you have the tools, this is the estimated cost for the raw supplies to build what you see. You could definitely save about $130 if you skip all the razzle dazzle features of the custom electronics. And that just means put a power strip in it and you're done with the electronics part of the arcade. There are some unknown costs. If you can find one of these TVs for free, then you're set. If you're going to go for this look, but you want to use a BVM or a PVM, then that drastically inflates your cost. So it's really up to what you can find and what resources you happen to come across. And using an arcade monitor is outside the scope of this project. It just makes things a little bit more complicated because of the different frequency mismatches and different standards for video signals. My cost is a little bit less because I already have a lot of parts and supplies left over from previous arcade projects. How long did it take to build this arcade? I've kind of lost count, but I estimate it's around 80 hours. Um, it's more like 60 to 70 if you don't include this video, but a lot of that is just designing and testing from scratch because I'm, I'm really just designing without a plan. I'm just feeling things out. And the complicated electronics and programming for just those extra features, are, which are unnecessary, also attribute to a little bit of time. But if you had the CAD files, this would probably take you around 50 to 60 hours uh, just because... The CRT television is a custom job and that was a little difficult to do since I'd never done one before. So I count that as part as the time to build this arcade. Could I do this to an arcade one-up? 
I think you could do everything but fit an actual CRT television inside one of those cabinet bodies. And if you're really achieving for that feature, you might as well build a new body anyway, since the front panel cutout is pretty specific and custom. And if you're going to change the depth and front, I would avoid making modifications to those cabinets anyway. Why not use a Raspberry Pi? I can't seem to find any of mine, so... Can you put a blank console in it, or will you make a Nintendo version? Yes, I have an extra television that I've kept for a long time, and a Nintendo version is something that I will do in the future. Is it for sale? No. Will you sell it? No. What features were cut? There were a number of features that I essentially like wrote down on paper that I wanted to accomplish, but they were just cut due to time and complication making the project like a never-ending thing. Uh, and that was an LED matrix marquee, which I've messed with before, but the matrix modules that I have and what I can find on the internet, uh, whole integer modules don't fit in this size. So really, if it doesn't fit right, I'm just not going to do it. I also wanted to do turbo buttons for the Sega, but the credit system kind of took up a lot of the room that I left for it, and things were just getting a little bit too complicated to follow if I added that too. I also wanted to do an audio spectrum display in the marquee or somewhere in the cabinet, and I have one, but things, again, just wanted to wrap the project up, so I decided not to do it. Do you need to use a CNC or laser cutter to build this project? No, you don't. And if you're going to get started, I don't recommend starting with those tools because there's just a big learning curve along with just how do I build an arcade if you've never done one before. And that follow-up question is, how do I get started? I've been building for about 10 years and I think some of the best designers just get started. So don't worry about if you don't have access to the fancy tools. All you need is maybe a, a hand router, a jigsaw, and a circular saw. And you can definitely do this. Some of the best designers just start. And as you build things and feel that sense of accomplishment, that drive will make you pursue better tools. So just get started because those better tools really aren't of use until you've got some experience and practice and familiarity with the skills it takes to build stuff like this. Why no vinyl graphics or full color vinyl graphics? Really, the cost is prohibitive for me since I don't have access to those tools to make my own. And I'm not a huge fan of the look unless I'm reproducing actual arcades that existed. So for this one, I would do the Astro City side graphics. But again, it's just, it was added features that really didn't have a function at this point. So decided not to do it. Okay, well, that wraps it up. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what you see and what I do, I have lots of other videos about arcade and gaming-related construction and building stuff. Otherwise, again, thank you for watching, and please share this video. It helps me out a lot.